Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode number 17 titled Buddha and Yoga. Let's look at the uh, third verse. Okay. Uh, third? Third one. Okay. Uh, Brancha Bahumata Dvante uh, Raja Yogam Raja Yogam Ajanatam mm-hmm. uh, Hatta Pradipikam Dhate uh, Swatmarama Kripa Karaha. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Kripa Karaha. Yeah, Kripa Karaha. In the form of Kripa, compassion. Yeah, out of compassion. So, so owing to the do you want to so just read it? Owing, owing to the darkness arising from the multiplicity of opinions, people are unable to know the Raja Yoga, the Royal Yoga. Compassion is Swatmaram Swatmarama composed the author, composes the Hatha Yoga Pradipika like a torch to dispel their darkness. Yeah. So can I ask you then uh, what is Raja Yoga? Ask me. If they can't know, yes. Oh. Huh. So Raja means king or royal, yes. it's so mm-hmm. it's the best yoga. Mm-hmm. And um, it's any yoga that's it's the completion of any of the different approaches to yoga. Mm-hmm. And so it's the uh, realization of the nature of reality. It's, mm-hmm. It can be defined according to your metaphysical, your metaphysics, you've got to define mm-hmm. it. Um, let's see. One traditional uh, Vedantic definition is the one realizes that uh, um, Atman and Brahman are mm-hmm. the same. Mm-hmm. Absolutely indivisible. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you were a Buddhist, you would find that a bit awkward. No, no, that's cool. Oh, okay. That's not a problem. Cool. Okay. And and then the state is described uh, in. We this define the, maybe the Atman and the Brahma a little oh. bit, a tiny bit differently. Okay. But but, but we should so get into that. But, but it would be is, fine to use that language. Actually. Okay. Yeah. I like Atman is just in normal Sanskrit the word for oneself. Mm-hmm. And so if you're just talking, like I'm talking about me, myself, anything I'm referring to is me. And of course, then in Advaita Vedanta, what you're discovering is, is, is you, all of the things that are not you initially. Uh-huh. You uh, think you are all the things you are. Yeah, like I'm, right? oh, I'm not my fingernail, I'm not my body, I'm not my mind, I'm not any of the content of the mind, I'm not mm-hmm. the subtle intelligence, mm-hmm. I'm not the winds, mm-hmm. I'm not the pranas. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And all of the, well, who are you? Okay, well, keep looking. And, uh, <laughs> you are God? Yeah, and what, what is that? It's not anything <laughs> you think, it's not anything. And so Atman is the actual indefinable nature of, you know, even if you said anything, it's, then you have to keep looking. Well, what is its actual, Atman is the actual, what's, it's the actuality, uh-huh. of the reality. Right. Um, and what we discover is that Atman is empty, empty of self. Mm-hmm. It has nothing. No matter how deeply you look, there is no ego. There's no self or anything separate there. But Atman turns out to be everything, mm-hmm. but not even everything. It's it's you. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so when we say Atman, and everyone is doing yoga, I wanted to find my Atman, and. It still has a local quality, you know, realize yourself. Mm-hmm. And then the word Brahman, which is a separate evolution in uh, Indian philosophy, it's a, a Vedic term, mm-hmm. tends to mean that which expands, which its nature is like this holographic mm-hmm. endless expansion, mm-hmm. uh, this interpenetration where you, it's this, like this gigantic net. Mm-hmm. Every point of the net is, is the center of the net. But it, it's mm-hmm. lacking in a sense of local quality, local, you know, just an ordinary word. You say Brahman, people think of this great ocean of light or something. Mm-hmm. And they don't think of specific things, you know, like mm-hmm. cheese and wine or 
whatever goes on locally in the Catskills. Okay? Whereas you say Atman, you know, you're thinking of like a little bit of more like, even though you're not these things, you're still thinking of, well, you know, personality, uh, fear of death, oh, I can't overcame death. And so there's still this kind of subtle dualism philosophically between Atman mm-hmm. and Brahman. Mm-hmm. And so to realize that there's absolutely no difference at all is to understand. And this is something you realize rather than understanding intellectually. Mm-hmm. Okay. And can I, can I read, do, do that from the Buddhist sure. side to get rid of the notion that there is this opposition? In the sense that the Buddhist side starts with anatman, the non-self, or no-self, or selflessness, we call it. And that's sort of where, uh, which would just, as he rightly said, the paramatman, the supreme self, is, is the realization of your freedom from all of the things you thought we think we are ourselves. Body, mind, speech, possessions, whatever, all of that. So there is this naiti naiti process where no, 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 neti neti they call it, right? Where you're not this, you're not that, you're not the other, and then it turns out you are the ultimate, which is everything. So the Buddhists start right away with the anatman, and they say that <coughs> what you are is lacking a self, Meaning that all your relative selves are not absolute. So they're not really you. They're relatively you, but, but and we wrongly tend to think that our relative identity is our real identity. As my old guru used to say, my Mongolian guru used to say, people are not wrong to think they're real. The problem is they think they're really real. <laughs> <laughs> In, the, in other words, we exaggerate sublim, subconsciously. We people think they're sort of absolute. That's why, like the the irreducible me, you know what I mean? And uh, they have a self identity that's irreducibly themselves. So the the Vedanta way goes where you reject all the minor attributes, the relative attributes of self, as being the real self. And when you come to the real self, you call that the supreme self which actually has none of your individual characteristics, and therefore you say that supreme self is Brahma. The Buddhist way is you realize your selflessness, meaning that all of those sense of self is not you. And then emptiness, they call Brahma as an emptiness. The equivalent of Brahma is emptiness, which just means that it's empty of any personal fixed thing that you could relate to. So in a way, that's why it's shared, like, like everyone is Brahma. You know, in Shankara's, and in fact, Shankara's form of Advaita was unpalatable to the majority of Vedantins in India. He was actually accused, even very soon, in Indian terms, very soon, a mere century or two after he wrote, he, even though they have Shankaracharyas there, he personally was accused of being Prachanabhauta, which means a closet Buddhist. <laughs> And the reason he was is that if you say that Brahma is nirguna, meaning unqualified, absolute, and in that sense shared, you know, when you realize you're Brahma, you realize everybody else is Brahma too. So you're actually not that special in a way. You, everybody is Brahma, do you know what I mean? And, and everybody can realize they're Brahma, right? So that means that things like the caste system, the difference between the Brahman, the Kshatriya, the Vaishya, and the Shudra, and the Chandala, that these are just relative human-made, man-made artifacts. There's nothing absolute about them. And actually, the Chandala, the outcast, is Brahma too, is Nirguna Brahma. You know? And when you realize that you are, you realize you are the outcast. Do you follow me? So it's radical non-dualism. And this, they didn't like that. So they came up with what they call Vishishta Dvaita, qualified non-duality. And then ultimately, with a great philosopher, Indian philosopher called Madhva, in the 16th century, in the 1500s, they came up with a brilliant Indian invention called Dvaita Advaita, which means dualistic non-duality. Yeah. And dualistic non-duality <laughs> preserves the specialness, yes. in Madhvacharya's case, of, of Vishnu as the supreme god. Right, right. In other words, Saguna Brahman. there is this level called Brahman, but that's a lower off-sloughing of the right. supreme godhead, of the supreme deity. Right. Therefore, they maintain their specialness, right. uh, their exclusivity, uh, and their 
political and economic positions. That's right. Just like and they don't have to look at the most religions religion religion do the, the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And and so that's why so that so so that's why the Buddhists and Shankara are actually no problem, very very close. And the Buddhists and the Vishista Dvaitins or the Dvaita Dvaitins, etc. And they're all the beautiful, sophisticated philosophical things. Every single one of them are the greatest philosophers that ever walked. Oh, they're incredible. Indian, Sanskrit is the greatest philosophical language. And they're just amazing. But the Buddhists and the Advaita, the real heavy-duty radical Advaita Vedantins, were always in tension with them because radical non-dualism erodes erodes, you know, absolutized hierarchies. And that is why in Tantra, which I believe is the source and very closely connected to Hatha and Yoga, and as we will explore here and, and we'll discuss and we'll get Richard's view of that. But Tantra, Tantra yogis have to do those five M's. And they have to do these things that many of them were brought up as Brahmins. And so then they have to eat meat have to drink wine, they have to have sex, they have to, what, what, what's the other one, that's three, and uh, madana, maitana, maumsa, and probably some mutra, uh, drink wine, uh, oh, mudra. urine and feces, I think, that stuff like that's that. That's not one of the No, no, they're supposed to eat feces and urine. That's a different. <laughs> no, no, that's, in, that's I think it's in the impure things. Yeah. Well, at least the Buddhists do that, that's okay. <laughs> because one shouldn't make a distinction between gold and shit if one is really too non -dualist. so But of course, it's not nourishing to eat excrement. So therefore, it's only a matter of breaking the taboo. <laughs> it's breaking the taboo. However, recently, uh, yes. um, uh, what they call fecal implants are being used in medicine. That's true. If someone has bad flora in their gut. And that's true, they do that. Um, well, they also sell Vermont dirt pills. Yeah. But there was a Siddha, do you know the story? Did I tell you the story about the Siddha in Benares that Alan Admiral told me? No. no. Well, there was a siddha, Hindu siddha, you know, or like a not siddha probably, in Benares. There was a famous case in the 60s when this friend of mine, a great painter, perhaps, I hope he's still alive, but I haven't heard from him in years, Alan Atwell, a great, great painter. And he was there, and he said there was this notorious case of this siddha who lived in a park in Benares in one of those sort of squares where they had restaurants and things and shops, you know. But he always hung out in that sort of park in that sort of central part there. And he would poop wherever he felt like it. And the merchants were upset because it was driving away middle class sort of you know, cleanly, cleanliness oriented uh, customers. So they had him up in court. And uh, he, he didn't want a lawyer to defend, represent him you know, for creating public disorder or whatever he was doing. And he just sat there quietly. And they had all these witnesses about, well, he pooped in front of my restaurant. He pooped in front of my jewel shop. And he pooped on my, in front of my ice cream stand. And they're really freaking out. And then finally, finally they finished their prosecution. And, uh, he, and the, my judge said to him, well, Baba, do you have anything to say in your defense? And he said, bring me a plate and a knife and fork, <laughs> which they did, because they respect sadhus in, in India. And he took that plate and knife and fork, and he pooped right there in the, in the courtroom, on the plate. And then he calmly proceeded to eat it. And he said, there's nothing impure here. And the judge said, case closed. And he was exonerated. <laughs> In, in the 60s, I don't think in it was. In the 60s, a, yeah. Uh, what? Yeah, they've devolved since then. I think they've devolved. <laughs> but Alan Adwell used to tell that story with great relish, which I, uh, I share. <laughs> and he was not a Buddhist, he was a oh, no. yogi. Yeah. It's because it's beyond this kind of Buddhist. Um, actually, yeah. in, in Sanskrit, the Bauda, Prachana Bauda, that word Bauda, secondary yeah, derivative of the word Buddha. They didn't use that word themselves, the Buddhists. They were adhyatmikas or nana or bahya bahyapas or something like that. They insider and outsider they called themselves. Yeah. They didn't there was no word for Buddhists versus non Buddhists or something like that. You were inside some practice or you're outside, that's all. And at the Siddha level there's absolutely no difference. They say there's no difference between Shiva, Vishnu and Vajradhara, which is the, mm -hmm. the yogic form of Buddha. Yeah. Which is also blue. It's yeah, a, interesting blue. The, 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 blue yeah. well, the dark blue is the ultimate reality color. It's yeah. Ultimate reality perfection color is a very dark blue black. Like like a monsoon cloud. Like a monsoon cloud, and they say it is the transmutation of the poison, the klesha, the addictive poison of hatred. 
It's very interesting. The most fierce of the poisons is hatred. Is the one that because the hatred has a tends to destroy things. So it's the energy that destroys the takes apart the facade of the samsara of the structural world of suffering. It demolishes that world, and that's why I said that's at least that would be a Buddhist explanation of it. Yeah. Well, Shiva has the, the blue throat. Oh, he has hara, hara, yeah, from yeah, from drinking. Or he didn't swallow it. He didn't drink it then. He didn't. Well, he <laughs> he only took it to here and held it I see. in the akash. Okay. So he didn't spit it out. He didn't swallow it. But he's totally cool. Yeah. <laughs> and he turned blue. Right. Yeah. Well, they're absorbing the poison, but that, that, that's connects to the maestro de I'm sure. Absolutely. So an Shiva is a yogi. It actually interfered with his love life. Because Uma, Uma was not sure she really wanted to like snuggle up to some guy smeared with cemetery human bone ash <laughs> with snakes in his hair and like blazing flame in his third eye. She used to have to she she would play strip poker with him or dice and win every time and make him take off the snake and wash and all that. Really? Yes, she domesticated the young mad yogi. She did. There's a wonderful poem. Kalidasa wrote a marvelous poem about it. It's really beautiful. It's a poem. It's Another side note is the word Swatmarama. It was a beautiful uh-huh. name for the, the composer of the text. Because when you say Swatma, you're meaning the self of the self, because swa is another reflexive right. pronoun that means self. Right, his own self. So it means the self of the self. Right. Now the self of myself, when I talk talking about myself, it's one thing, but if I start talking about the self of myself, That's right. then you know I'm really That's talking. It's the real self of the yeah. full self, right. And rama, it means the pleasure. So it's the pleasure of the self of the self is the guy's name, swat, the rama. Right. Who I think I think this is arama with a long uh, meaning addressing pleasure. Swatma. So, uh, oh yeah, swat swatma. Atma no is wrong. Yeah, it could be either arama or rama. So he's atma. enjoying pleasure. So yeah. atma, in his own self, enjoying pleasure in his own self, because of course non the non dual, the non what well, Buddhist tantrikas would say, yogis would say, that that ultimate reality of Brahma. The Brahmahood, or near what they would call Nirvana, they could also call Nirvana being blown away. That ultimate reality is not known by ordinary dualistic conceptual cognition or understanding, what we would normally think of understanding. It is known only by bliss. The subjectivity that knows that is that expansive, you know, ecstatic bliss where it blows it blows you out, kind of, you know. So it's not a matter of if you clutch on to it, you give yourself to it through bliss. So they, the way they express that is that bliss is what knows it, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Which is kind of nice. So Swatma, his own self, is bliss actually, his own right? self and is he's bliss. enjoying he's yeah. enjoying the universe. And out of his compassion, mm-hmm. uh, he um, dispels the uh-huh. the darkness from uh-huh. Brancha Bahum Bahuma. Um, so. And a brancha, brancha means Error. bad philosophy mm-hmm. or bad views. Mm-hmm. And there are thousands and thousands, there are just endless numbers of bad views. Mm-hmm. And many of us entertain many thousands of them throughout the day. Mm-hmm. And these are just <laughs> bad philosophies mm-hmm. in which you're not really seeing reality. Mm-hmm. Um, and so to dispel that, and so not only is it referring to between the schools, mm-hmm. which are always arguing with each other, right. you know, Iyengar yoga versus Ashtanga yoga, and it's like, <laughs> give me a break. Okay. <laughs> and then Shia versus Sunni, you know, it's like, right. same. Um, but uh, so not only there, but mm-hmm. amongst ourselves and between our you know, our, we make many theoretical selves throughout the day, many mm-hmm. different points of view. Mm-hmm. And all of them are merely point, they're all context dependent mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they're all empty mm-hmm. of any absolute mm-hmm. position. Mm-hmm. And therefore, this will cut through that, the, the, mm-hmm. the light of Hatha Yoga, the mm-hmm. Pradipa of, of Yoga will cut right through that. Mm-hmm. The lamp of it. Mm-hmm. Can I say something about compassionate? Since I mentioned bliss, mm. in the sense that the non-dual realization is such that the person who realizes it achieves 
permanent total bliss, right? But there has, there's an awkward element in that bliss for the non-dualist, in the sense that they perceive their oneness with all beings complete. So therefore, while they feel blissful and they see all beings as blissful, they cannot ignore that most of the beings see themselves as not blissful, but are dissatisfied, they're suffering, they're held in darkness, they're, and the key darkness is they think their separate self, their self that is separate from the universe is real, is really real, and therefore they suffer. Right? Like me. I think I'm really real, I'm Bob Thurman, and I think you're all different than me, and you outnumber the hell out of me. <laughs> and all other beings in the world outnumber me even more. So since, since and then there's the ticks. <laughs> and there's the, 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 the bacteria. Of those, yeah. What? There are billions of ticks and... Billions. Billions to the billionth power of bacteria. So I'm, exactly. Exactly. So, so I'm freaked out and I'm suffering. I'm struggling with this other, which is the world, by my delusion of being myself separate from them and that that division is absolute. And there's only battle across the line, really. Sometimes there's friendliness. Mom liked me. <laughs> you know, my, my, my lover liked me. My baby liked me. But it's for a while. It all is for a while. But, <laughs> but, but mostly everybody doesn't think as much of me as I think of myself. <laughs> so I'm in, I'm in conflict with the world, in a way, on a, on a primal level. And, and even there are philosophies that say that's the way it is, you know, and you just have to, like, have nuclear weapons or something. And, and the, but the non dual person sees that, and yet they are frustrated by the fact that they cannot blast that suffering and that delusion out of the people and sort of bliss bomb them. <laughs> because the energy of that bliss, if they sort of just radiated it, the person who feels separate would feel invaded by it, overwhelmed by it, and they would tighten up even more, and they would become more freaked out. And they would, they would crucify the blissful being, or waste them and somehow do them in, if they could, and if not, they would run away from them, or whatever. So that's where the compassion comes in. The compassion, we wrongly think that being compassionate is somehow to just climb into other people's misery. But that is that wouldn't help them. And that's not really compassion. That's just joining their their suffering. <laughs> compassion is completely feeling their suffering and not feeling it at the same time, keeping the bliss, so as to see, to act and engage in just such a way as to get them to rediscover that their suffering is actually bliss. You follow me? So therefore, the compassionate Swatma Arama, someone who's really self-enjoying himself. <laughs> so compassion meaning he's feeling that we're there, you're not self-enjoying yourself enough, as you should, and as you could, and as you will. <laughs> so he writes a book, giving you some message to do that. Do you follow? <laughs> so it's very important to note that you can, genuine compassion requires that your duty, if you want to be a compassionate person, you have to be happy. Because you have to know what the happiness that the other person you're compassionate about is missing. Otherwise, it's like, oh, I'm so sorry for that person, but like, I, su I suck too, so we both suck. <laughs> and I'm nice, so I say something nice. But you, it's nothing. It's not real compassion. It's some kind of, it's some kind of wimpy pity, uh, which then just leads you into more self-pity. Whereas compassion is a dynamic thing based on your happiness and realizing the other person could have, but they have to learn how to do it and you then write a book. Okay? <laughs> As he did. That's is that alright? I just felt because we were talking about bliss and people get nervous about bliss. They do. It's illegal. In well, the you get States. guilty about it. <laughs> what? You get, it's guilt, you know. guilty. Guilty, but that's because it's illegal. It's shameful. Yeah, except in Colorado. <laughs> They're okay yep. in Colorado. And Washington. State. And Washington. Yeah. And Oakland. Oh, okay. Downtown. <laughs> Jerry Brown's hometown. Okay. So, so, so I just wanted to say that, okay? So he composes the Hatha Yoga Pradipika like a torch to dispel it, the darkness of unrealistic worldviews. And the worst unrealistic worldview that we all have here, just to let you know where I'm coming from, and what, what is, is one takeaway that we, it's, it's the specialty of the house of Mitha. The idea that you will be nothing after you die. 
That is the disease of materialism slash nihilism that probably all of you yogis are free of. But that is the worst of the false views, of the unrealistic views, the, the most dark of them. And, um, and even if we think we believe in reincarnation, we have to excavate in our subconscious about how we felt the last time we heard Richard Dawkins give a lecture or something, or some book, Sam Harris, you know, attacking religious people and things like that, and realize that we're brought up by science teachers to think that they have authority in saying that they know and they have discovered that the mind is an epiphenomenon of the brain, and that therefore you don't have a future life. When you just blow up your brain, you're nothing. And you, therefore you are essentially nothing right now. Because anybody can blow their brain right this second and they'd be nothing. According to them. But that's totally false. You're never going to be nothing, okay? You have, you have the guarantee that that's the men law. Mountain retreat stands behind you. <laughs> Big guarantee. Big guarantee. <laughs> None of us can ever be nothing. It's not possible. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh. Just, just to, because it mentioned the darkness of Rome. Yeah. Okay. Now he gives the lineage. You want to do the lineage? I think we should pay homage to the lineage. But, but it's up to you. You're um, the guru of this. Well, it starts out with Matsyendra and Goraksha. And mm -hmm. So both of these are very famous uh, siddhas. And uh, Goraksha has a whole lineage. Uh, and in fact, there's a, another book that's equivalent to this that is um, composed mm -hmm. by Goraksha. Goraksha mm -hmm. Samhita. Some of these people, like Anand, Shavara, you know, th these are the, among the 80 siddhas, are they, of the, of the Indian sort of tantric yeah. uh, yoga tradition? A few of these I've heard of. And... Shavara is, um, is an important, they, in the Buddhists have a set of what they call 84 great adepts or Mahasiddhas, yeah. uh, great attained ones, and Matsyendra and Shavara uh, and Nata, Nagarjuna they call him as Nata, could be Nata, so it's something, and they, they don't make a difference between Buddhism and Hinduism. Yeah. Uh, Gorakhnath, I'm not sure is in the Buddhist list, but probably is, but I, I, I don't recognize it right away. Yeah. And I, I sort of see Siddhi Buddha. Siddhi Buddha. Is that Buddha himself that they're, they're claiming? As Why not? I hope so. Yeah. Yes, he'd be happy to be claimed. Kantadi, <laughs> Karandaka, Swirananda, Siddhipada, Charapati. That could, Siddhipada could be a, a Buddhist. Kanera, Pujapada, Nityanatha, Niranjana, Kapila, Kapili, Vidunatha, Kang, Kaka, Chandishwara. So many. It's just like names and names. Are any of these female? Do we know? Choli, Choli is a fiend. Uh, Choli? That's a. Bahuniki is feminine. Could be. There, there's, out of the 84 in Buddhism, they have a bad record. Only four, Only four. are female of the 84. But about 60% of them have gurus who were female dakinis or yoginis or something. But somehow they don't get mentioned. They didn't write a book. They just shaped, you know, they made the guy eat fish guts and so on. I mean, they shaped them up. <laughs> but they don't list them in the lineage except for four, which is, which is wrong, which is bad. Mm -hmm. It's a residue of chauvinism, I think, in the culture. Yeah. Anyway. So we can make up for that. Good. So, but, uh, you want to jump to nine? Like a house protecting one from the heat of the sun? Or, no, oh, that's a ten. Oh, no. uh, Mahasiddhi Hatha Yoga. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these Mahasiddhas, uh, breaking the scepter of death, are roaming in the universe. So this is What's a, the Sanskrit word for scepter? scepter? Um, is it the Hinduism? They have Kaladanda. Oh, Kaladanda. Kaladanda means these stopping time. Yes, yes, the staff of time. Yeah, which is better than the, the, the scepter of death is yeah, scepter of not death. in here. The, 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 so they have the, the, club, cl the, club of, the club of death, of time. The club of, the time. Club of time. Right. Yeah. The so Yama holds that. Yeah, and so if you have that Kaladanda, club of time, or the staff of time. Yeah, so my, just in my mind, my image is that you, the staff of time stops time. Uh-huh. Uh, but it's also the ultimate weapon that, uh, you know, that these, these lords carry the ultimate weapon, which is time. Mm -hmm. 
or patience. Mm -hmm. And so, you mm -hmm. know, Vishnu has his Sudarshan chakra, mm -hmm. which he spins on his finger, and then, and it's like a boomerang, it comes right back to the finger, but it slices Right. Everywhere. Right. And, um, and Yama carries a club with a skull on the top. Yeah. Which which brings death. Yeah. But they well, broke his scepter. Yeah. And so what you do is the Sushumna, the central Sushumna mm -hmm. Nadi uh -huh. is the uh call it uh -huh. it okay. breaks time uh -huh. because once prana goes into the uh central channel, the chitta stops constructing time and space. Uh-huh. In other words, just, which is a construction. It's it's merely that, mm -hmm. and so that construction of time and space stops. Mm -hmm. And so, what what does death mean? Mm -hmm. And you you have that experience, the direct experience of that through this. So, mm -hmm. um, and then they say they're still roaming the universe, mm -hmm. and so here we are. You know, probably a few of these are mentioned here in this list. We say whatever happened. They probably, you mean they're around. Yeah, well, sure. they could be right here at the retreat, like Tintini. It's not just Obi Wan Kenobi who can appear <laughs> in, in a luminous body. All these siddhas are there. Buddha is there for sure. Mm -hmm. Roaming the universe, and they're they're not really roaming idly. They're roaming to help beings. You know, they're traveling around. Yeah. So they're the but, but can you come back to Sushumna? Sure. So how does Sushumna? Oh yeah, that's the second question back in the early verse. Explains Hatha Yoga for the attainment of Raja Yoga. Mm -hmm. So then that requires in the second uh, verse. So what is how does Hatha Yoga form a basis of Raja Yoga then? Okay. So he's teaching Hatha Yoga to then attain Raja Yoga. Right. So Hatha tends to mean in a lot of the early texts, it means force. You know, like if you don't, uh -huh. if you don't just get this by hearing, you mm -hmm. know, um, uh, that you know the nature of reality, then we got to get some exercises for you. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and have we got exercises for you? <laughs> and so, and it's been explained esoteric in this that ha stands for the sun and ta. Uh, palatal ta uh, is the moon and so these are two complementary opposites, mm -hmm. two ends of the same stick and that it is a practice of one in the nadi system of taking the uh, sun channel and the moon channel and mm -hmm. uh, balancing them so that mm -hmm. they are simultaneously open in the same way and then shutting them off in order to open the central channel. So the yoga, in a way, at the deep level, the yoga of the two is opening the central channel. It's to open the central channel through mm -hmm. a dialogue between ha and ta. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in our stage of practice, which is raw beginning, mm -hmm. it's finding the inhale in the exhale, mm -hmm. because they're complementary opposites, mm -hmm. or finding the counteraction in the primary action or the finding the what they call the um, pratipaksha kriya. Uh -huh. So pratipaksha bhavanam, and so in the in, antidote. Yeah, in realizing. contemplation. Yeah, you start to look at something. You start to look at its pratipaksha, meaning its context or its other wing. Paksha uh -huh. is a wing. Uh -huh. And so when you get the opposite, both wings to work, uh -huh. then you get a synthesis between the two things. Mm -hmm. And that moment of synthesis is stuns the mind because it no longer takes either path. Mm -hmm. And so the mind is stunned, it doesn't go anywhere, which is nowhere, which is the central channel. Mm -hmm. And so physically this manifests in the body as a central channel. Mm -hmm. And so all over the body in Hatha Yoga, we're discovering patterns of you know either sensation or flow and then systematically creating the counter action, mm -hmm. the other wing of it, mm -hmm. and then coming into a, a, a sattvic state or a contemplative state or a middle path state. And so you do that in the, the realm of the prana, uh, in hatha yoga, through mudras and bandhas and pranayama. And then, hopefully, you can do that also philosophically, mm -hmm. in which you start to understand conceptual systems as also empty, also as needing 
having context and balance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you start to have the same phenomena intellectually of the middle path. Mm -hmm. And uh, in all of these, the mind hits what they call the unmani stage, mm -hmm. or no mind. In other words, mm -hmm. the prana stops moving, and it's just like, ah, bliss. bliss. Mm -hmm. And that's the middle path is, mm -hmm. is bliss. And so, and so the, the Raja Yoga is the ah. It's the middle path. Mm -hmm. That's the king, and that's what mm -hmm. we're really talking about. And whatever technique you've got to use, whatever you have to balance might be slightly unique to you mm -hmm. because you have individual circumstances mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. slightly unique. Mm -hmm. Usually sure. we're not as unique as mm -hmm. we like to think we are. <laughs> we're just slightly <laughs> unique, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> but significantly. But then, so then the, then the Hatha Yoga is unraveling the knots and the blocks of the central channel. Yes. And with which was the, the, the Raja Yoga. Yeah. It's open. And so once your central channel opens, and you can taste the Raja Yoga anytime. In mm -hmm. other words, the nature of the non-dualism is that any system, even in its plugged up state of all knots and just being mm -hmm. on this lower level, mm -hmm. it is composed 100% of Brahman, mm -hmm. or it is already 100% Shunyata, mm -hmm. bliss. So you're like a... Just as it's in its mm -hmm. actual immediate nature. Uh -huh. And you can realize the Raja Yoga at any mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. And I think we all do. We get little hits momentarily. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, like in in this text, it's not quite as clear. It's mentioned a little bit. You can go into your central channel. You don't have to go into the bottom like we're working on, you know, to get the kundalini to mm -hmm. stop plugging it up. But you can go right in the, the uh, executive entrance. <laughs> uh -huh. Right at, at the root of the palate, which is... Uh -huh. And you can do that uh, anytime. In fact, you don't have to do it. The idea in Raja Yoga, and this is what makes it funny, is it's slightly beyond technique. Mm -hmm. um, it's, in other mm -hmm. words, it's insight into the very nature of technique mm -hmm. being empty. You, know, you don't even need it. Mm -hmm. It's like a joke or something. <laughs> um, and it's something that we get little flashes of, I think, every uh -huh. time we like really connect with other people, sure. other beings, or two systems meat. In, in the tantric physiology yeah. and the different thing, when you yawn, actually, you, yeah, you, yawning. you little oh, get the central practice. channel. You verge the prana toward the central channel. When you faint, when you fall asleep, mm. uh, you know, those things are all... Uh, exactly. The reason you energize from a yawn is that your draw energy comes out of the central channel. Because you're a little bit open, they usually clamp it shut and then it's open a little bit. Right? Now, yeah. how to, no, just to have a question. Yeah. The ha is the sun, which is the right hand, solar channel, and the ta is the moon, the left hand. Mm. And is the sun identified with the female and the, and the moon identified with the male? As in Buddhist tantra? No, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. Ah, yeah. ha, ha. Uh -huh. Which is delightful. Because it's slightly arbitrary, you know. 